in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 today. As you know, when, you, when we read the book of James, we have to take under consideration that James is writing to Jewish believers. And so this book has, the content of this book, has a lot of information that only the Jewish people could understand in the proper context. But, however, it is for all believers else, everywhere. James is known for his practical, ethical principles. He's concerned about believers living out their faith. Not so much as talking about it, but we are to practice what we preach. We are to live what we profess. And so, in the fifth chapter, after talking to the rich men and, and then encouraging believers to be patient, as we wait for the Lord return, in verse 13 he says, is any one among you afflicted? Is there anybody among you afflicted? Then he should pray. Now this word afflicted covers a variety of subjects the Amplified Bible says if you are ill-treated or if you suffer evil. So by saying if any one of you are afflicted, he could be any range of things that affects us, including disappointment, including the loss of health, the loss of our property, persecution, even sickness or whatever bereavement, a loss of loved one, a whole range of things. If any of us are facing problems, if you are afflicted in any way, he says, pray. Pray about it. In this scripture, he's given us um, three situations in which we can pray. And he says, first of all, we are pray if we are afflicted, if we're having some problems. Now, he's telling believers that you need to develop the habit of praying for yourself. Because God does answer prayer. No matter what happens, God does answer prayer. And so when we have problems, rather than complaining about it, we are to pray about it. Rather than getting angry with God because he allows these things to come into our lives, we are to take our problems to God. And he says that when we cry out to him, he will hear our prayers. The Bible is filled with situations where God heard prayers. David is one that always confessed that God heard his prayer. As we know, Saul chased David and chased David, and David spent a big portion of his early life running from Saul, hiding away, hiding away in cave. But he, he prayed, and God always gave him deliverance. God always answered his prayer. You see, that's one situation where a person is facing problem when they are uh, afflicted. It could be problems of any nature that we learn to take our problems to God. And then he says, if anyone is glad at heart, then he should sing praises to God. How many times have you been happy and, and uh, just spontaneously you start singing to God, singing praises to God? It, it, this Greek word here means uh, the gladness as a state of mind. Uh, a mind where you're free of trouble and aggravation and agitation. Not necessarily mean that you're glad as far as rejoicing and partying and dancing or whatever. 
It means that you have peace in your mind. The problems that you got doesn't get you down. That perhaps you prayed and God has answered your prayer. You're surrounded by problems and you prayed and God has answered your prayer. And so you sing praises to him because of what he has done. So when you have problems, he says you pray, and then when God answers your prayer, then you sing praises to God because of his faithfulness to us. Verse 14 says, and we are also to pray when we're sick. He says, is anyone among you sick? He shall call in the church elders, and they should pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now you notice he says here, is anyone sick among you, he should call in the elders of the church. Mm -hmm. Call the spiritual leaders. It could be your deacons, it could be your pastors, those who are spiritual minded, consecrated men and women who can get a prayer through. And I think that is important because we have some people who I don't believe can get prayers through. Because, not that God doesn't hear their prayers, but you know sin does in the prayers from being answered. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, then God won't hear me. That means if I hold on to those things, I know they're there, but I don't want to let go of them. I know that what I'm doing is wrong, but God sees my heart. And even though I'm not living right, even though I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, God knows my heart. He does know your heart. But he also expects you to obey, expect you to walk in obedience. And so he said, you're to call in the spiritual guides. When you are sick, you are to call in the spiritual guides. And you notice he said you are to call them. And they are to go to you, not telephone you, not call you up on the telephone, but you're to go to them. But he specifically say you are to Call them, and I, I mentioned this because sometimes you might get sick. You don't call the pastor. Nobody know you're sick, and you're at home angry because nobody has called you, and no one has come to visit you. He's laid the responsibility on the sick person to call the congregation to come and to pray with him. And he says you are to call them in, the spiritual leaders, the anointed men and women of God. He did say one person is poor. That means that it's better for more than one person to go and pray for someone. It takes the, it takes the light or the spotlight off of an individual person who may be considered themselves so anointed that it's their responsibility to always go and lay hands on a person and pray for a person. And so he, he's involved in the entire congregation because the spiritual elders, the, the leaders, spiritual leaders, is representing the congregation. We know God answers prayer, but he's given the congregation the responsibility of dealing with their sick people. The whole congregation has that responsibility to be concerned about its members when they are sick, at home, and need prayer. Sometimes we don't go and lay hands on them, but we will call them up and we will pray for them depending upon the situation. I think it's okay to call someone to pray for them, but in a special situation, when they call you, you need to go. If they call and say, will you come over and pray for me? 
Sometimes when a person is really, really sick, they can it's hard for them to pray for themselves. So you go and you pray for them, but we must not neglect those who are sick among us. Sometimes people don't understand, as with uh, the situation with, with Manny, that I had asked the congregation to call him and when he was in the hospital. And apparently he was hurt over the fact that nobody did. And the first, next time I saw him, the first thing he said to me was, I'm not going to church. I'm not going to church. Not just because they go, they don't go to him. With that was his own decision. As I said, See? first the first thing he said was, I'm not going to church. But the thing is, he was just getting his feet wet. He was just beginning to come. He had not yet been grounded enough in the Word of God and in Christ. And so he was just a baby, and there are times when we just have to spoon feed babies. In fact, there are times when you have to give babies a bottle before they are ready for strong meat. All babies, when they are first born, they are on bottle, they are on milk, until they get older and then they are able to eat. My point is we take care of one another, and especially the weaker sister or brother among us, it is our responsibility to do that. God gives the church responsibility. He gives his congregation certain responsibility, and we are to care for each other. We are to look out for each other. And he says, he, you call them in, they go in. You, they anoint you with oil. Now, you might think that you're talking about just miraculously getting healed by pouring oil on them, but we need to understand that. As far as the Hebrews were concerned, and even now, olive oil was used for medicinal purpose. It was not just for religious purpose. But they were of the persuasion that when people get sick, they would anoint them with oil, and the oil was like a medicine. So this could be a situation where he's saying that, that God will heal them, even through medicine. He didn't say how he was going to heal. He didn't say how soon it was going to happen. He didn't say he was miraculously healed them and raised them up that day. It could be a situation where the healing began to take place. You take, there are times when it's necessary to take medicine. Or it was a medicine. They didn't have doctors like we have them today who give you a, a whole prescription, 10 or 15 different prescription pills to take. They didn't have it, praise God. They, Maybe that's why they lived to be seven and eight hundred years old. But, <laughs> but they would use oil. They would pour oil on it. You, do you remember the Good Samaritan? When the man was sick, he poured oil and wine, wine on his wound. Because they often travel with oil. And I understand in the East, now they use oil to put on their skin when they're traveling to, to help to, to uh, protect their skin from the sun. It's just that oil, and we've got to remember, James is writing to Jewish people. And that is their custom. <coughs> that when someone is sick, that is their custom <coughs> to use oil. That is their custom to use oil when people are sick. And so he's saying, not so much that you're going to go and perform a miracle when you go, but that you're going to go representing the congregation, and you're going to go to the person's house, filled with the Holy Spirit, and pray for them after anointing <clears throat> him with oil. Verse 15 says, and the 
prayer that is of faith will save him who is sick, and the Lord will restore him, and if he has committed a sin, it will be forgiven. He will be forgiven for He seemed to be connecting here sin with sickness. In other words, there's a possibility that this person is sick because there's some sin in his life. Many times we are sick because of sin in our lives. An example of this would be a person who commit fornication with every Tom, Dick, and Harry, end up with AIDS, or other venereal diseases. <coughs> so it is, a, it is a result of that sin that they are sick. And sometimes a person use drugs and have a bad needle, infected needle, and it gets sick. And then there are times when just because of sin, it just burden us down, we get just depressed over it. And um, irritable, our conscience is bothering us. We know we're doing wrong and we keep doing it. And we get sick, our blood pressure will go high because we're depressed. So many things can contribute to our being sick. Depressed. Mental. He didn't say what kind of sickness. There are people who are mentally ill. I don't mean they're crazy. They're mentally ill, depressed. There are so many people now, I don't know why. It seems that almost the majority of the people now are diagnosed as being bipolar. I think the doctors just don't know what's wrong with them, so they'll put in this label bipolar upon so many people. But they have problems, they have mental problems. Bipolar people that I've been around are sort of schizophrenia. Today they're the most beautiful person you ever know. Tomorrow they, they're ready to straighten you up. Because what another personality has surfaced. These people need the elders of the congregation, the spiritual leaders who are filled with the Holy Spirit, to go and lay hands on them and to pray with them them. You see, there's a whole range of things here that James is talking about, not just physical sicknesses, because God wants us to be whole in the, in the uh, spirit, the mind, and physical. Consequently, when a person is sick, the spiritual leaders go and visit them, and you may realize that this person is sick because he's not even eating right. So you're going to have him out of it. Tell him how to exercise and eat properly. If you know that certain food is going to cause you to have high blood pressure, it's going to cause you cholesterol problem, it's going to cause heart trouble, if you're going to run your blood pressure high, why do you waste your time in praying for them? They got to deal with those problems first. You know why did they need to deal with those problems first? Because if God healed them today, tomorrow you're going to eat the wrong food, your pressure is going to get high. It's a vicious circle, a vicious cycle. And I think that's why sometimes we don't really get the healing that we want and we, we can't blame God for it. We're saying we're praying and God is not answering my prayer. I've been sick for a long time and God is not healing me. And God is saying to you, Hello, I want to heal you, but you got to watch that fried food you're eating, uh, all of that chocolate cake you're eating, uh, uh, that rum raisin ice cream that I love so much to eat. He says that <laughs> you gotta <laughs> you gotta watch those things. Ice cream. You see what I'm saying is this: there's a lot involved in healing as far as God is concerned. Now if you don't believe it, you read how he dealt with Israel. He gave them a diet of food where they can and they cannot eat. That was to help them to stay healthy. We expect God to come in and just work all kind of miracles over us and just zap us back to health. And it's good to be healthy, but we have to stay healthy. We have to work at staying healthy. 
And that's what God wants us to do. So when your spiritual leaders go there, armed with the word of God and armed with the Holy Spirit and armed with knowledge also that's going to help the sick person to get well. He says, you pray over him in the name of the Lord. So that lets you know that it's, it's really the power and authority that God gives you in the name of Yeshua because he has given us that authority that whatever you do and ask for in my name, that's authority. He's given us that authority. So we go using the authority that Yeshua has given us and ultimately healing is going to come from God. We pray and we believe God is going to heal us and we work with him. And so we pray when we have problems, we pray for ourselves. And so when we get sick, we send for the spiritual leaders, and they pray for us. And then the third thing, the third time we have to pray, is when there is sin in our lives. Look at verse 16, it says, Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart by the honest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its works. So he says, confess your sin to each other. I realize that there are some things that we can confess only to God. Some sins that our fellow man, our one another, our brother or our sister can help us with. Some things we have to confess to God. John says, 1 John 1, 9, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. But if we confess our sins to God, that he is faithful and just to forgive us. We confess certain sins because God is going to forgive us. But... We need to confess it to each other when we hurt each other. When we do something that's going to harm each other. When we have offended one another. Or there are some things in our lives that we just need to talk to somebody about. And so we may make a mistake and we talk to our brothers or our sister about it so that they can pray with us. Or if we come to pray and and realize that somebody has something against us. You go to this person and you try to make it right and you two pray together about it. This person is going to forgive you. You're going to pray together about the mistakes that you have made. When you slip up, when you offend somebody, or when you sin, or when you have a fault, but when you have committed a, a really bad sin, you be careful who you confess it to. Because uh, sometimes the person is not really committed to Christ and you can cause more problems. I don't suggest that you would stand and give a testimony for the whole congregation of any sins you may have committed. It's really, really bad. There might be somebody in the audience who's not committed to Christ. As this woman did, as I shared before, she had been unfaithful to her husband. God saved her. She was so rejoiced over it. She stood and she gave her testimony. There was somebody in the audience who wasn't saved. By the time she got home, they had called her husband, and they ended up in a divorce. You see, God wants us to use wisdom, you see. Because everybody in the congregation is not committed to Christ. He said, confess to one another, not to the whole congregation. It's sort of a one-on-one -on -one situation. Like if I have a problem that I want to discuss with Mary, and I talk to Mary about it, and 
we share it and we pray about it. Or uh, maybe Mary and the rest of the congregation, and I confess to them a mistake I have made because I know that you're committed people and because I trust you and I feel comfortable talking to you because of the Spirit of God that's in you. And then I know that together we can pray. And he said to pray for each other. And God will forgive you. And God will, for, and God will heal your offenses. You pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. Because when you confess, then God is going to restore you. So, and uh, if he, he, will, he will also restore bad relationships. And that is so important in the congregation of God because Satan just stirs up trouble all of the time. He's going to always stir up trouble. But you know so We have to stay on top of it. And we stay on top of it by obeying what God tells us to do in his word. He says the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man has tremendous power. He's talking about a person who is powerful, a person who, who prays energetic, powerful prayers, not necessarily long prayers. Long prayer, not necessarily effective, but powerful, adequate, energetic prayers, not cold, listless, lifeless prayers that you just pray in because somebody asked me to pray. And so you just sit there and, mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for <laughs> this day. And Lord, I ask you to heal the sister here. There's no power in there. It's just a dead, lifeless prayer, praying out of duty. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a prayer that's power driven by the Holy Spirit. And it can only be power driven by the Holy Spirit if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, those kind of prayers avail much. It has to be a righteous person, or a righteous person is the one who continue to live right before God. So James is giving us some sound advice here, some instruction for the help of the congregation. When we have problems, we pray. When we get sick, the elders pray for us. And when we sin, we pray for each other. So there are three different settings here. We can learn to pray for ourselves. When we can't pray for ourselves, send it for the righteous spiritual leaders of the congregation. And then when sin is involved, when we make mistakes, then we pray for one another. But we have to be willing to confess that sin, not to cover it up, not to try to hide from it, people. Not try to let everybody think that everything is fine. How are you doing? Oh, fine. No problem. And you're done inside. You're covering it up. But he said, confess it to one another so God can heal. <coughs> because God wants his congregation to operate in power. And it's one thing about this one when it says pray for one another, it means that one another, we, we are accountable for each other. It's, it's accountability, and I think that every believer should be accountable to somebody else. Because when we off to ourselves, Satan will 
isolate us off to ourselves. We try to do things our own way, the way we want to do it, the way we've always done it, and we don't want to involve anybody else. We've got to be accountable. See, he's making us accountable to each other for the wrongs that we do, for the mistakes that we make. We look after each other. We are our brother's keepers. And that way we help to keep the congregation of Yeshua clean and pure and operating in power. I believe that God wants his people to walk in good health in every area of their life. He wants us to be healthy spiritually. He wants us to be healthy mentally. And he wants us to be healthy spiritually. God is calling for a congregation that is without spots or wrinkles. And so we have to begin to work today on the things that we know we're doing wrong and be willing to accept the fact that we are not perfect and we don't always do those things that are right. We don't always walk the way we should. We don't always do what God tells us to do. But we've got to start trying. We've got to start trying. And even today, there may be something in some of our lives right now that we know that we're not dealing with. And God's been speaking to us for a long time. And we know it's not right, but we keep right on doing it. God is calling for us to deal with those things today. Don't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. We just have this minute. We can be sure of only this moment right now. I know a few years ago, I talked to this lady about her relationship with God <clears throat> on Sunday. And she said she was good. Her relationship with God was good. I was questioning because of the way she lived. That was Sunday. And Monday, she walked out on her way to work and she got hit by a car and she went on into eternity. We don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. We can't just keep putting it off. God gives us a date, and if the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about some things that we know we need to deal with, we, we let it go on for a long time, and God wants us to deal with it today. What he said, so that we will be healed and restored. He wants us to be restored into good relationship with him, to walk in the spirit to be filled with the spirit and we get a telephone and then that call in the next minute say come over and call for me and pray for me I'm very sick that with confidence you can walk over and pray for this person but if there's sin in your life don't bother to go because as David said if I, you know it's there you're not dealing with it don't bother to go and don't just go and lay hands on anybody if there's sin in your life I'm very particular about who slap their hands on me to pray with me. Because you know what? In the scripture, the apostle will lay hands on people and they receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe by the same method, <clears throat> if a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside of them, if they have an unholy spirit operating in them and they slap their hands on you, you'll get that unholy spirit. They can transfer his unholy spirit upon you and cause problem in your life. And I tell you this because of what I experienced personally myself. And I lived in Philadelphia. And I was going to this congregation. I was working with their nursing home ministry. And uh, we would have a meeting before we go to get together. And I had a terrific headache. So bad I could barely open my eyes. And this young lady just walked over, slapped her hand on my head, and my headache went away. And that night, it seemed like every demon from hell filled my bedroom. <laughs> I, it, it was such a, 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 a 
awesome prison there. It, it almost feels like I'm sat on the side of my bed. But I had recently read a situation like this. I rebuked that healing. My headache came back and immediately that spirit left. <laughs> you see, you got to be, I didn't ask her to pray for me to begin with. But because she was spiritual, she, boom, slapped my hand on my head. But we have to be careful. And if you're not walking in the spirit, if there's sin in your life, don't lay your hands on anybody to pray for them until you doubt with the sin in your life. So James is giving us some advice here. Don't despair if you have some problem. Pray, talk to God about it, and he will answer. David said in Psalm 107, he, um, that when people were in trouble, he, verse 6, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them out of their distress. When we cry to him, he would deliver us. In verse 13, he said, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. Again, in verse 28, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distress. Over and over and over again, when you cry out to the Lord, he will answer. And he will deliver us out of our distress. Don't despair. God will hear. And God will deliver. Pray when you have trouble. Sing when you're happy. As Solomon said in Proverbs 17, 22, a happy heart is good medicine, and a cheerful mind works healing, but a broken spirit dries up the bone. A happy heart is like medicine. How often have I been maybe have some off days and I talk to my sister, I talk to someone, and I start laughing, and then the whole atmosphere in my house changes. A happy heart is like medicine. You laugh and cheerful when my sister was alive. She was my best friend. I, we, I talked to her, I would call each other, and no matter what was going on in our lives, before we hang up, we were laughing about it. It was as if it never happened. Laughter is like medicine. Let's follow the advice that James has given us and see that if things don't begin to change in our circumstances, our time to be delivered from everything that's hindering us in our relationship with God. God wants to turn our situation around, but he needs our, needs our cooperation in order to do it. He, it's not like a magic portion where God goes zap and all our problems are gone. He could do it, but he's not going to do it because he's given us some advice and some instruction and he says, if you're careful to do them, if you listen, do what I tell you to do. I will bless you. I will heal you. He wants us to walk in good health. Because the congregation has a purpose in this world. And it's not just for us to just meet here and sing a few songs, a dry song, some sing, some don't. Just to meet here and sing. <laughs> and leave and go home and watch television or whatever the rest of the day. God has a plan for our life. He has a plan for our ministry. He has a plan for his Congregation at large, but he's just waiting for us to get in a place so he can start working his work through us. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word today. And we take note to follow the advice of James.